Really remarkable is the disproportionately large share of sales attributable to Amazon publishing titles, which again probably shouldn't be in a big a big surprise. Having a relationship between publisher and retailer is advantageous for everyone. It works for Amazon because, of course, they're going to take a cut both as publisher and as retailer. And it can be helpful to the authors as well because it's only natural that Amazon the retailer is more likely to sell books that are printed or published by Amazon Publishing. This is a class of case of what economists call vertical integration, a direct relationship between the provider of the goods and the seller of the goods. Couple that with many people's extreme loyalty to Amazon and the extreme ease of ordering products from Amazon, and you have what can be a sweet deal for many authors and has proven to work well. Many people are members of Amazon Prime, where you pay a fee every month or every year annually so that you have Amazon benefits like uh, special deals and offers and also being able to borrow, so to speak, books from KU, their lending library, all of which tend to favor books that are published by one of Amazon Publishing's branches. This is what has drawn so many well-known and successful authors to them, to Amazon Publishing, like, as we've mentioned recently, Dean Kuntz, who just signed a multi-book deal with Amazon Publishing, or Patricia Cornwell. Robert Dugoni has been with them since 2013, and as a result, he may be the best-selling thriller writer in the United States today. You may, you may hear more about the names like uh, John Grisham, and James Patterson, but Dagoni may actually be the one selling more books. As I said, Amazon Publishing uh, puts out all kinds of titles, but their real strength has proven to be genre fiction, which probably isn't surprising. That's what sells best. That's what the big five traditional publishers are publishing and selling more of than anyone else. So no reason to expect Amazon to be any different. And they are having huge success with lines like Thomas and Mercer. That's the Amazon publishing line or imprint that publishes mystery thriller books. The bottom line here is that if you're somewhere around the age I am or possibly even younger, you may have been sort of inculcated to think of New York as being where the publishing industry lives. You need a New York publisher to be a real writer or to be a top writer. And to be fair, there's still some good work coming out of New York, but there's also some equally good work coming out of regional presses and small presses and university presses, people outside the New York system. And now this and other publishers hailing from Amazon. So the bottom line is when you're trying to think about what to write and later where to take it, you might think about or you might uh, instruct your agent to think about sending it somewhere in addition to or instead of New York, like maybe Seattle. My interview for this podcast is with Aaron Henneke, a movie TV book scout at Franklin and Siegel, and a highly successful one. What I think perhaps has led to some of Erin's enormous success is the fact that she worked for several years in traditional publishing with a New York publishing house, and then worked in other areas of the film industry, and now is working full-time as a scout looking for books, stories, projects that can be made into film and TV series. This, of course, is coming at a time when it seems like there is more in production than has ever been before with all the new series and movies, for that matter, coming from streaming services and a host of new networks and production companies. She talks about her work and also talks about what you, the Red Sneaker writer, might be able to do to make your work in progress more appealing to Hollywood. Here's what she had to say. Erin, thanks for coming back to the podcast. Happy to be here. Thanks again. 
you have not always been with the literary scouting agency. You started out working, you were with Barwood, right? The, yes. The Barbara Streisand, is that a production company? Yes, that's or? Barbara Streisand's production company. What kind of work did you do there? I was a story editor there and I had been there for three years and I had been previously in publishing in the rights department. Oh, and in I, some New York publishing house yes, or something? Like Penguin. Oh my That's gosh. Where I started. What'd you do there? I was in subsidiary rights and I did both adult and children's rights. Mm-hmm. I did domestic and foreign. So I did a little bit of each, but I would get all these calls and faxes from movie production companies, from studios asking me who the agent is on this. We got one that mm-hmm. said, Who is the agent for Jane Austen? <laughs> so I just wrote And you said me, me C A A and I faxed it back. And I we just had a good laugh over that. But um I started getting all these calls. I would get all these calls from film and movie people and I kind of became interested. So I said, Well, yeah, I'll give you the information you need, but let's can I do a little info and in, you know, informational with you? How did you get started and really learned about this world of development that I never knew existed? Mm-hmm. So I was an English major. I love movies to do something that married the two. Oh my God. Perfect. Right. So you transitioned then from Viking to, to Barbara Barbie. Streisand. <laughs> yeah. Was just were they lead. looking for somebody who could acquire projects or? Yes. Yeah. I think they were looking for somebody with a book background as well. Oh, really? So that was helpful. Was this before or after the Prince of Tides? It was Obviously after. based on a book. Right. Yes. Which she was so involved in and mm-hmm. so Directed like really her. did a great job with it and worked closely with the author. So yeah, it was after this, it was uh, like late 90s. That I was there. Mm-hmm. And it was after Mira had two faces, which didn't do so well. Um, so she was looking, they were looking to acquire books. I, I saw a lot of theater too that they could have mm-hmm. adapted because the two things that we kept getting submitted, right. that prospective projects that people wanted Barbara to do, mm-hmm. Yentl 2. Yentl 2? Yeah, like another Yentl. <laughs> Yeah, until yet again. Um, or, Adventures in America. Or yeah, something. or something like that. You know, like Papa can hear you. We got it. <laughs> or um, the way we were again. Like uh, they were the two uh, things. I can almost see a sequel to that one. They though. worked on one for a long time. They were close. Uh, the way we were was based on a book, though, right? Uh, the the film. Did or maybe the there was a novel. Maybe it was, no- maybe it was, was a novelization. Novel. I'm remembering that came out after. It might have. I think that might have been an original script. I'm not. A, don't quote me. I'm not. I right. should know that, but I don't know that. So you were uh, at this point not just looking at books. You were just looking for looking pretty much ideas, for everything. Yeah, ideas. projects for things for her to direct mm-hmm. or things that she would just produce. And while I was there, we did a family movie for a Showtime family. Um, we. Did we meaning with the Barbara company. Streisand, yeah, the she company. Produced it, yeah, okay. through Barwood Films. Mm-hmm. And we did a TV movie uh, with Lori, Lori Metcalf that was on NBC. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also readied a documentary about women, in, pioneering women in Hollywood for AMC. Did that happen? That did. That did. That aired. And it was amazing the number of women who worked in Hollywood as screenwriters, as directors, in the 20s and 30s, as, a pa- as opposed to now. Oh, really? They Even before so Ida more. Lupino. Exactly. Hmm. But so many more then. That seems even more timely now than when it probably aired. I, I think you do. you still have the rights to they, that? They need to reissue that again. <laughs> Get on it, AMC. Really? Okay. And then at some point, you transition from Barwood to working for Franklin and Siegel, where yes. you are now, right? Yes. And now you just scout for everybody? I scout for two. My two clients are on the feature side, I scout to, for Universal Studios. Mm-hmm. And then on the TV side, I scout for Paramount TV. So two very big studios Mm -hmm. looking for two different kinds of things for two different mediums. How do you know what would be right for them? Because these are large entities who I would think do all kinds of projects. They do. Yeah. It makes it challenging. But when I came from when I was at Barwood, I felt like I had everything I was submitted was in such a narrow Mm -hmm. niche. Like I said, Yentl too, or the way we were too, (laughs) like things that they just thought Barbara would be interested in starring in. And now it's like anything can go. Like it could be sci-fi. It could be romantic comedy. It could be drama, thriller, you name it. They're looking, both studios are looking for everything. Is there a difference between the two? I mean, how do you think, do I take this to Universal or do I take this to Paramount? 
Well, I kind of break it down to, is this a feature or is this for TV? And the overlap is greater now because TV is so good and they're mm-hmm. taking such chances with shows like Big Little Lies and True Detective and things like that. So it's kind of all bets are off now. It really can be. If I feel like there's something, there was a book that I got my TV guys to option that had been under option for feature. Mm-hmm. It was a book called Station Eleven by Emily St. John mm-hmm. Mandel, yes. which mm-hmm. I love. Yeah. But I read it. I was like, this is not a feature. This is a series. I could see five years easy out of this book, like as a jumping off point mm-hmm. and going from there. And like, you know, like Walking Dead was based on a graphic novel and right. things like that. Like it can give you a jumping off period. But if the characters and stories are so good, you can continue them on. Sure. So I told my TV guys, like, let's keep an eye on this, because when this comes up again for option, jump on it. And they did. And they got mm-hmm. it. So they're developing it as a, as a series. I mean, the cliche has always been that, uh, you know, the book was always better than the Mm -hmm. movie in in part just because that's what people experienced first. But also because reducing a 400 page, 80,000 word novel to an hour and a half, well, obviously a lot's got to be left out. But if you can expand it to a season of 10 episodes or, as you were saying, even multi uh, season projects, that's. That's got to open a whole world of much more satisfying possibilities for. And we're seeing it all the time. Look at Orange is the New Black. Mm -hmm. That was a memoir Piper um, Kerman wrote. And nobody thought like, oh, maybe they'll get a season out of this, whatever. Mm -hmm. And just I think it was the fifth season that just debuted. (laughs) They're doing a sixth. Mm -hmm. like, And they're signed up for a few more seasons, too, with Netflix. And that's that, that was their big breakout hit after House of Cards. Right. It seemed to me when I watched The Handmaid's Tale, the mm-hmm. first season essentially adapted the book. I mean, there right. were some changes, but more or less, uh, and additions in particular, but more or less adapted. But of course, now it's still going. There was a yeah. season two that really is n- not in the book. Not at all. And, and got to go into different on. areas, yeah. and, you know, which yeah. is expanding it, which is interesting, which I thought was great. I mean, I wonder, I want to see where they take it next. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you, are there things authors could be doing? Uh, you know, you want to put the book, make the book good, obviously, because right. that's step one. But things they could be keeping in the back of their mind that might make something have more potential later on down the line to uh, movies or streaming television or anything. I think kind of further to what I said earlier about doing research, mm-hmm. know the market, know what's streaming know what's popular on netflix and hulu and amazon and i love it that little quirky shows like mrs Maisel did so well and it kind of was a late bloomer hit like it didn't hit right away and it was kind of word of mouth that made that grow and i love that show and the art direction is just amazing and i love the lead actress who just won an emmy she's wonderful and alex borstein too so they got two emmys in the acting categories I think just knowing the market out there, being realistic about what's popular, what's selling, what's out there, what your competition is, what are your comparisons, just kind of being a well-versed, knowing what is doing well in the market currently. I mean, the project you just mentioned, Mrs. Maisel, is Mm -hmm. almost like a triumph of character over uh, setting. I -hmm. I think a lot of people are, uh, particularly younger people, will object to a historical setting. But if there are strong characters, if it's interesting and funny, you know, they'll tune in anyway. Or you see something like Mad Men and how well that show. Like, I remember watching Mad Men and my father and my brother would say something like, I remember my brother being so particular about the set. And he'd be like, I recognize that lamp. 1966, (laughs) they nailed it. That's it. So it's it's having the 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 great setting as well mm-hmm. for a great story and a world that we haven't seen before. Right, and great characters. It Absolutely. still seems to me that, that whatever like you're writing, that, characters that, felt like that was like a novel. Yeah, characters are are paramount. Absolutely. Aaron, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Bill. I appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron, for that terrific interview. And I just have to say, if you would like to meet Aaron in person, pitch your ideas to her or to other agents or to meet any of more than 50 presenters, come on out to WriterCon. 
It is not too late to register as I record this. So go to the website writercon.org, W R I T E R C O N.org, and see if this might be just.